From nowhere, they appear like shimmering visions. Following roots they know by heart, along ancient paths etched into the earth. For two years, a filmmaker and a veterinarian would track them as they come and go. to see deep into the lives of these magnificent beasts and learn the language elephants use to communicate over distance and time. In the end, they hope to confirm what they already suspect to be true. That elephants may communicate in many different ways, but they all speak the language of survival. With the first rays of sun, American filmmaker Ginger Mone begins a long day's work in one of the wildest places on earth. Namibia's Atosha National Park. Living in Atosha is like being part of great live theater with an ever-changing cast, constant dramas, and animals that never take direction. My husband, Conrad Brain, plays a big part in this real-life production. He's a pilot and he's the only veterinarian in this huge park. He also has a great eye. Who's in there? Who do you see? Growing up in the United States, I never imagined that I'd be raising a child in such an incredible place. Are you ready? Where's the oh. print? <laughs> Located in the southern African nation of Namibia, Etosha is roughly the size of Massachusetts. It's one of the few natural landmarks in Africa clearly visible from space. Much of the park is a vast barren mineral pan the remnant of a prehistoric lake. Many animals roam this austere landscape, but none are more restless than Atosha's elephants. Their ancient paths crisscross 8,600 square miles of scrub brush and sand, an area they navigate using the memory elephants are famous for, and something few people know about an incredible system of communication. We want to do a film for National Geographic that follows Atosha's elephants and unlocks some of the secrets of how they communicate over such great distances. To do that, they have to get close to a group of elephants, close enough to observe them as they go about the day-to-day -day business of trying to survive in Atosha. following one particular breeding herd of elephants and Knob Nose is the matriarch of that herd. She's got this massive wart on her nose and she's incredibly recognizable. Knob Nose wears a radio collar that will help Conrad track her herd's movements around Atosha's vast expanses. But even with an airplane, the elephants can be difficult to track. Knob Nose keeps her herd constantly on the move. Tracking the elephants in Itosha, the only thing that was constant was that we never knew what to expect. Some days we'd find big groups of elephants, some days we wouldn't find any elephants. Other days we'd find them in an area completely distant from where they were the day before.
Over time, Ginger and Conrad would become familiar not only with the herd's movements, but with its leader's particular grace and style. Nobnose is a beautiful animal, warts and all. She is also tremendous in size, maybe nine feet at the shoulder and weighing three to four tons. As matriarch, Nobnose is responsible for the survival of her 18-member herd. She has walked the Tosha's plains all her life, perhaps 50 years or more. A virtual map of the park is burned into her memory. She knows which routes lead to water and which lead to ruin. An elephant that seems to have a particularly close bond to Nobnose is recognizable even from the air. She has an enormous hole in her ear, so we call her Donut. Among the elephants Nobnose leads are two of her own offspring. One is a playful young male. A female may one day succeed Nobnose as matriarch. At first, she must master Atosha's pathways and the language of survival. When a large, boisterous male splashes into their midst, breaking the peaceful mood, Nobnose trumpets, signaling her surprise, and the herd rushes out of the pool. Rather than be left alone, the male decides to follow. the pool, Nobnose is really moving. She seems to have a very definite destination in mind, and we have to hurry to keep up. As Nobnose marches her herd across the landscape, other elephants join their procession, as if they're following the lead of a gigantic Pied Piper. seem driven and driven together by some irresistible impulse. They don't stop for food or for water, they just keep going, even through the night. The next day, after trekking 35 miles in less than 24 hours, Nobnose at last brings her herd to a halt. They sniff the air for danger, hesitating before moving on. Finally, Nobnose decides that the coast is clear and leads the group forward to a mud hole of all things. Elephants love a good mud bath. It cools them down, gives their skin a protective coating of mud, and from the looks of it, it's a lot of fun. somehow knew that conditions would be right at this mud hole on this day 
And that's truly remarkable, because only one pool in her herd's enormous range has mud this deep, and only when it's been rained on, which might happen once every few years. Eventually, Nobno sounds the let's go rumble, and her mud-soaked herd files out of the pool. Watching this drama play out, we were beginning to understand the true relationship of a matriarch to her herd. They depend upon her for leadership, and they trust her wisdom and judgment. It's a bond that helps ensure their collective survival. The only bond that may be stronger is the bond between a mother and her infant, a fact that was made clear to Ginger and Conrad when a two-year-old calf came under their care. This elephant's mother was shot outside of the park and he was found standing over her dead body. At two years old, he was still nursing when his mother died and he refused to leave her, despite the fact that the other herd members probably urged him to come along. We know that elephants communicate in many ways. They use physical gestures, of course. And they also use sounds. But elephants also speak to each other in a language we're just beginning to understand. The language of infrasound, low frequency calls that humans cannot even hear. To make these sounds, some scientists believe the elephants create vibrations that resonate in their upper nasal cavity, an area located right between their eyes. Using these low frequency sounds, elephants can talk to each other over distances of one or two miles. But like young children, a young elephant's vocabulary is probably limited, and there's just no way that a two-year-old like this one could survive in a Tosha alone. After caring for Ellie for two months, we loved him, but we couldn't teach him how to be an elephant. For that, he had to be with his own kind. Though there are some 1,200 elephants living in Atosha, finding a breeding herd that would accept a two-year-old orphan took a lot of time. It took three weeks of searching, but eventually Ginger and Conrad located a breeding herd on a private farm outside the park. It's okay, Big Eddie. It's going to be a good place for you. They released the young elephant there, and he was accepted into the herd within two days. Now, they knew he would learn the language of elephants, a language Conrad and Ginger were determined to learn as well. The old bull, ne? To really understand the elephants and their language, we have to be close to them, and you can't get much closer than this. That's so good. Here we go. That is You're a big boyfriend. Our base is a simple camp, 
built around an abandoned horse stable. Here we're surrounded by wildlife, including elephants, day and night. And the only thing between us and them is a simple fence. Fences are important in Etosha. The park is surrounded by some 500 miles of fencing. Fencing that often cuts off traditional elephant transit routes. The elephant paths are so prominent in most parts that past aviators actually used elephant paths as navigational aids. It's very easy from the plane to see the major paths that the elephants use because they're just so huge. The ancient pathways lead far beyond the park's boundaries, pointing the elephants to food and water perhaps 500 miles away in Angola or Botswana. It seems impossible for Atosha's elephants to know this today, yet an intense and inexplicable urge often pushes them beyond the park's fences. These human inventions get little respect from an elephant with bigger things on his mind. Though crossing a fence this tall can involve a certain degree of risk. No matter how determined an elephant might be, in this barren landscape, taking the wrong route can lead to oblivion. How do Atosha's elephants know which route to take? Communication could be part of the answer. To find out more, Michael Garstang and his wife Elsabee have come to Atosha from the University of Virginia. He's a meteorologist but he's here to conduct experiments relating to elephant communication. Just watch out for that lion. She's up brightly, see her head is up. Garstang believes changes in atmospheric conditions increase the distance that certain sounds can travel. He thinks Atosha's elephants take advantage of this fact, sending more low frequency infrasonic messages at particular times of the day. Elephants use low frequency sound, and that isn't affected by trees and other obstacles, can travel a very long way, but only if atmospheric conditions are right. Garstang's theories on long distance, low frequency communication are based on changes in atmospheric conditions that occur every day. During the day, Temperatures at ground level are warmer than those above. But at dusk, the situation is reversed. Temperatures on the ground are cooler than those above. This is what's known as a temperature inversion. Because of their height, giraffes may be among the first to feel the change. At sunset, the temperature may be 20 degrees cooler around their knees than it is around their head. And when conditions are right, you actually see the inversion layer. During a temperature inversion, a warm layer of air hangs over the savanna like an acoustic ceiling. The elephant's dome-shaped infrasound waves bounce off the ceiling and reflect outward, sometimes to great distances. Garstang believes there's a connection between the quality of a temperature inversion and the distance infrasound can travel. Using a network of specialized microphones, he plans to eavesdrop on the elephant's infrasound calls. At 
the same time, they'll take atmospheric readings near the ground and use a weather balloon for taking readings several hundred feet up. This equipment should allow Garstang to measure wind speed and the strength of each temperature inversion. Garstang doesn't believe that Atosha's elephants do all their communicating around sunset. He does believe the frequency of communication increases during an inversion. Let's say your telephone company only allowed you to talk in the evening and in the early morning, and at no other times of day talking long distance. So if you were going to talk to your family, those are the only times you could talk. You would condition your whole day around those times so that you'd be sure to be able to talk to your family at those times. It's no secret that many animals communicate at dawn and dusk. But do they do it to take advantage of atmospheric conditions or is it simple coincidence? Lions don't use infrasound, but they do most of their communicating just before sunrise and just after sunset, roaring to bring the pride together and define their territory. Like lions, elephants do most of their long distance communicating around the same time and a call that might travel only one mile at noon can now be received up to six miles away. Long distance communication can be crucial during the difficult days of the dry season. For the next few months, dust showers will replace mud baths, and both food and water will grow increasingly scarce. But it still takes a lot to sustain these animals. An elephant eats about 500 pounds of vegetation a day. And if you look at, say, a herd of 30 elephants eating 500 pounds each, that's 15,000 pounds of vegetation. When that herd feeds over an area, especially in the end of the dry season when there's not much food, another herd coming and feeding in the same location wouldn't find anything to eat and would have wasted a lot of energy to get there. So the herds actually stay separated, and they're staying separated by knowing where each other is, and it's long-distance communication that does that. While a lack of food works to keep the elephants apart, the need for water often forces Atosha's animals to congregate. zebra ventures to the middle of the pool to drink, but at the height of the dry season, the zebra's treat becomes another creature's trap. A young kudu is overcome by the mud.
As unbearable midday heat forces the rest of the animals to abandon the pool, the kudu appears doomed. But Conrad has spotted the trouble. He and his team take on the messy rescue mission. At the height of the dry season, we might pull animals out of mud holes once a week to prevent massive contamination of that water hole. The frightened young kudu gets a second chance, and not a moment too soon. Many injured or aged animals that linger too long at the water hole aren't so lucky. Predators seek them out for an easy kill. As the dry season drags on, it takes a toll on everyone, including Ginger and her family. They too must live outdoors and contend with the onslaught of heat, dust, and blowing sand. While being out here increases her chances of tracking Knobnose and the herd, it doesn't guarantee that Ginger can always find them. Knobnose has lived through more than 50 years of dry seasons. She knows keeping the herd moving is half the battle. This time of year, water is very restricted in Atosha, and there are few strategic water holes within their normal range. So it's just a matter of sitting and waiting and then hoping that they'll choose that water hole on the day that you happen to be sitting there. The wait can be long and frustrating. Then, the herd is here all right, and they have a surprise for Ginger. This is not Nurse's herd. And we've lost them for the last couple of weeks. We haven't been able to find them anywhere. And now I think I know why, because Donuts arrived with a little tiny baby. It's still got black fuzz on the top of its head. So maybe that's why they were keeping their distance. Where they've been hiding out is anyone's guess. But now the newcomer can keep up. So the herd is back in circulation. Reconnecting with the herd means Ginger can once again track their movements, and an unfinished round of experiments can be completed. Hey. Hello. How's it going? Great. Good. Oh, terrific. I've also had a great day. Have you? Yeah. Found knob nose. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. After all this time just down the road, 10 k's from here, and one that's got the hole in the ear that we call donut. Mm -hmm. She's got a baby. Yeah. Yeah. But they were sort of headed in this direction were they? as they left Camille so they could be mm. here sometime in the night. Right. Knob Nose and her family are indeed headed their way. Garstang's outpost is located near a regular watering hole. And in fact, elephant groups from all over Atosha 
will soon be converging. As the afternoon wears on, they begin arriving, following ancient spidery trails that they know lead to food, water, and communion. sunlight, their gathering takes on the cloak of ritual, and Garstang's microphones come alive with the sounds of low-frequency elephant calls. The complexity of the communication, I think, is great. We're just beginning to understand it. How do they develop the language? What is the language? Is it phrases? Is it something that we can equate to words? There's so much more to understand than we know right now. We're just beginning to understand this. But even the most elaborate forms of communication can't save the elephants from calamity. Throughout Atosha, a silent and efficient killer dwells striking these indomitable creatures hardest near the end of the dry season. A young bull stands over his fallen comrade, perhaps a traveling companion of many years. It's believed that elephants may recognize up to 100 individual voices. Could he have heard his friend's final cries? He stands guard for nearly six hours, oblivious to the danger presented by the open corpse. Anthrax, the disease that killed his friend, is easily transmitted. We know that when he finally moves on, death may be following close behind him, and there's nothing we can do to help. Anthrax is a bacterial disease. It's endemic in Itosha. It's been here forever and it's a sudden death disease for the animals. How they get it and how long it's been in their bodies is still a debatable question, but once they start showing symptoms or once it becomes systemic, they can drop dead in as quickly as 20 minutes. And they, they can drop dead while they're still walking so that when you find it, it's still got like the skid marks of, of it falling and dying that quickly. Knob Nose leads her herd to the site of the fallen bull soon after his faithful friend departs. This could be a dangerous place to be, but there's water nearby, and elephants regularly frequent this area.
Eventually, Knob Nose leads her herd away, perhaps sending out a final message for a voice now stilled. But in stopping here, they may have picked up a deadly hitchhiker. Anthrax strikes indiscriminately, but this year the young were particularly hard hit. The next time we saw Nobnoz's herd, the effects of this horrible disease were devastatingly clear. In one short season, Nobnoz lost both of her calves to anthrax. Whether due to illness or grief, she left the herd and wandered aimlessly for several weeks. of a matriarch walking away from her herd and when she did we realized the depth of her pain and we were scared for her even later when she rejoined the herd she remained isolated in her grief by how much death is a part of the elephant's journey and we were deeply moved by it. One day I was charged by a female and when I got a good look she was standing over a dead calf and you know, I paused for a second and I thought shoot you know she's there and it's very emotional and very dramatic but she is so clearly in distress and was it worth it to put her through more agony just to get a couple shots and I decided no, and I just left her and I came home, back to Kimber and back to camp. It's one thing for me to decide to leave a mother to her grief, and it's entirely another thing for her to decide to leave her own dead calf. I think it would take me a lifetime to come to grips with that sort of painful decision, and yet it's one that Nobno's faced twice in two short months. Four weeks will pass before Ginger and Conrad see Knob Nose and the herd again. And when they do, it is Donut who leads the group. Several of Atosha's herds have come together near a water hole, but Nobnose, Donut, and the rest of their group are here for much more than a drink. In the middle of this massive assembly, a small skull and a few scattered bones litter the ground. Hundreds of elephants are milling about, but only Nobnose and her herd acknowledge the bones. This isn't the elephant graveyard of myth, but it is a very specific grave site. These are the bones of one of Nobnose's dead calves. It's an extremely moving ritual of mourning. To us, it seems like a silent ceremony, but on tape, we record infrasound. For the first time, we hear the elephant's private language of grief.
these low frequency sounds seem to be intimate communications meant only for those nearby or even the bones themselves. For Nob knows the time for mourning is too short. She lingers, whispering to the bones once more, communing one last time with a departed soul. In the end, it is Donut who leads them away, as she must, for all of Atosha's elephants are about to embark on the longest journey of the year. As the seasons begin to change, there is uncertainty even in the sky. The clouds look as if they could either burst into rain or flames. 200 miles to the north, thunder roars, and remarkably, Atosha's elephants seem to hear it. The low rumble of rolling thunder has a huge infrasonic component, and the elephants respond to its call. It's time to head north and meet the coming rains. For the next two or three months, the herd will be out of touch. Ginger and Conrad may not see Knob Nose until spring, and then only if she survives. For both of them, it will be a long, tough wait. In the long journey north, most herds take the paths around the huge barren pan that dominates the park. But a few daring males contemplate the challenge of a shortcut. A trek across the pan is perilous for any creature. Over 2,300 square miles of flat salt-covered earth spreads out in every direction surface temperatures can reach up to 150 degrees. Animals appear distorted by the mind-numbing heat. Water is only an illusion, but the dangers are very real. Yet these five stand at the pan's edge, contemplating the risk. For the next four hours, they stand there in a silent tug of war. Then finally, two strike out, embarking upon a journey into no man's land. For the next 20 miles, they're without food and water. A single path leads them on, that and the memory of where it leads. By the time the rains finally reach the pan, the elephants have been gone for weeks.
We know that the elephants have moved north to greener pastures, and we also know that they'll eventually follow the storms back to Atosha. know, and what concerns us most, is whether or not Nobnos will be with them when they return. With the rains, Etosha blooms. a lake once more, a signal to Conrad and Ginger that the elephant herds should by now be wending their way south. It is two months since they last saw Knobnose, Donut, and the herd. In an area of 24,000 square kilometers, looking for one small herd can be just like trying to find a ship out at sea. It's a question of looking for them, coming back, trying to anticipate where they're going to arrive, when they're going to arrive. But it's in fact a very, very difficult time for us. This time of year, restless nights lead to early mornings, and every day we wonder if this will be the day that Nobnose comes home. And then, at last, the first of the giants finally return. From the far reaches of the park, they follow behind the rain, eating and drinking their fill. It's always great to see the elephants come back to the heart of Atosha, but this year the feeling won't be complete until we see Nobnos. Then they finally appear, and it's Nobnos who leads them. She's back, looking strong and assured. But there's more. Behind her walks a calf, and this is almost too good to be true. In fact, I'll only believe it's Nobnos's baby when I see it nurse. that Nobnos has a baby girl, and the herd possibly has their next matriarch. As time and season have revived Atosha's arid plains, so too has Nobnos been renewed.
She has recovered from the tragedy of her loss and now has a new reason to live. But the memories will always remain. The old statement of an elephant never forgets. It has long been surmised that elephants have this phenomenal memory. If you live with them for a couple of years, you are just overcome by their ability to continually amaze you. Nobnes and her herd have given us such a rare gift. They've opened up their world to us. Now we have a better understanding of how they relate to their environment and to each other. And yet they still retain their majesty and their mystery. Etosha's elephants live in a vibrant world, a world in which they use a system of communication we are only now beginning to comprehend. Theirs is an ancient language, passed down, practiced, and learned anew by each successive generation. It is the language of survival. 